Hey, welcome to the channel. Today's video is sponsored by Antronics. Multi-taps, line passives, filters, and so much more at www.antronics.com. All right, hello again, Penn Ohio family. It's Mike O'Dell from the Penn Ohio SCTE chapter. Today, I'm extremely pleased to have Mr. Chuck Phillips from Springbok Instruments. Um, I've known Chuck for a very long time, and he has uh, always been a, a fantastic resource to the, the cable television community in uh, training and support, and in particular, where MTDRs are concerned. So extremely happy to have Chuck with us today. Uh, Mr. Phillips, good to see you again. How are you? Good morning, Mike. I'm doing wonderful. And thanks for having me on. We really appreciate the opportunity. Well, we want to thank Springbok as uh, one of our partners and, and as a, a valuable partner to all chapters in the SCT and SCT nationally. So um, today's video is brought to you in part with uh, Springbok Instruments and the Penn Ohio chapter of the SCTE. Springbok Instruments, get connected. So now that we're connected, Mr. Phillips, um, let's talk about MTDRs because I feel like, you know, the uh, the direction of the industry is obviously in fiber, and OTDRs are very important to fiber-based providers. But it's it's been amazing to see how much value the coaxial portion of the plant has continued to add to operators, um, and so the ability to troubleshoot coaxial cables is as important today as it ever has been, but the needs are to do it more efficiently, more quickly, and more non-invasively than ever before because so much is riding on our coaxial networks. Would you agree with that statement? 100%. In fact, I would add to that, an MTDR is one of the most underutilized pieces of test equipment out there. And when I first came to the industry 30 years ago, they were letting us know, you know, you're on the wrong end of the business. You do know that fiber is the way of the future, right? And then, of course, we knew 30 years ago that fiber was the way of the future. But even 30 years ago, they were still manufacturing more metallic cable than they had in the history of metallic cable before. Now, obviously, that is finally starting to slow down. But to my previous point, it's not exactly like it's about to go away, not in this country. And certainly there are lots of other industries where they manufacture metallic cable, but it is highly underutilized. The I would agree that. with that statement. Um, I, I've found the MTDR to be one of the most underutilized pieces of test equipment, but also the most misunderstood as to the value of it. So that's what I'm hoping to do today is to get in the weeds with MTDRs and how they work and why they're useful. Uh, and how to best use them to support your HFC deployment. Absolutely. So you're feeding right into everything that I want to say. So let me get started by saying, since it is underutilized, I am amazed at how many times I run into people who are using metallic cable. And I'm going to speak specifically with coaxial cable. I am always shocked with how many people will let me know, you know, Chuck, I actually don't need a TDR that much. And I'll be like, you're using metallic cable and you don't need a TDR that much. I would argue that if you are using especially coaxial cable and you don't use a TDR that much, maybe it's entirely possible you don't know your TDR that well or you don't understand it. So whenever I do my training sessions, which we're about to do today, I want to make sure we start off with understanding the fundamentals behind what it can do. Because by having a better understanding what it can do and in some cases what it can't do, you'll know when is the proper time to pull out your TDR. So the first thing I want to make sure everybody understands is why is it called a TDR? What does TDR stand for? TDR stands for, of course, time domain reflectometer. And you're going to see as I get going, I'm really big into analogies. So you're just going to have to humor me while I come up with some of mine. Now, I use this screen just to let you know that every type of pulse TDR that is out there, this, this training, uh, addresses. Yes, I work for Springbok Instruments, but I want to make sure that if you ever have an opportunity to view this or if you attend one of my classes, I don't care which TDR you're using, please come to one of our classes because everything still applies. We will talk button pushing at a later date, but everything metallic TDR related 
Pulse TDR applies to this class. So first of all, with the principles of operation, I like to use the analogy because a TDR lots of times is called a cable radar. So I'm going to use the analogy where it's similar to a police radar gun. So in this case, you connect your TDR to the cable under test. It generates a high frequency signal. It sends that signal down the cable. As soon as it finds an event, it reflects some or all of that energy back to the instrument, takes the time that it took to get there, converts it to a distance time domain reflectometer. Now, I don't want to argue semantics here, but I like to think of what the TDR is looking for as events, not necessarily faults. And the reason I say that is because not uncommon where a customer will call me up and they'll say, hey, I've been out here all day long. And by the time I found out what I thought was the problem, I dug it up and I ended up digging up a perfectly good splice. You get that? They're upset with me because they dug up a perfectly good splice. Okay. Maybe I should have let you know that a TDR can find things that are supposed to be there as well as things that are not supposed to be there. So here on out, I'm just going to refer to them as events. I will teach you later on how to determine a good event versus a bad event. So TDR, time domain reflectometer. Hey, now, while, we're, while we're talking about analogies, um, mm -hmm. I want to maybe give you an analogy of how I think about a TDR. Um, I think it. the radar analogy is is a good one. Obviously, there's over the air energy uh, in the radar instance that bounces off of something and then is returned. Um, mm -hmm. I've always thought about like a wishing well, and I we've all seen them, right? You, you walk up to a wishing well and you can't see the bottom, but you don't know right. how deep it is. And the first thing that everybody wants to do is either toss a coin or a rock or something into the well. Always. And always it's it's human nature right but what you learn from that is a couple of things depending on how long it takes for you to hear the sound of the rock mm. or the, the the coin hitting the bottom and then what that sound is like because there's so so many similarities in waves whether it's through a metallic conductor or whether it's through the the air um that are consistent between uh, different wave propagation mediums but so if, if I drop a rock in a well and I hear it hit thud, right, that tells me a couple of things. How long it took to hear the sound tells me how deep it is. And the sound itself, the thud, tells me that the, the bottom is solid. Mm. Whether it's, it, and if there's water in there, you'll hear a splash. If it's mud, you'll hear that. Um, but that sound, we, we understand, you know, effectively what that sound means and, and what that time delay means and so i've always thought of an mtdr as exactly the same thing it's basically okay. dropping a, a rock in the well and listening for the sound i like that you know it's funny too mike because you mentioned delay a lot of times when i ask people what time domain reflectometer stands for tdr rather they'll say time delay reflectometer well you're not that far off <laughs> right i like that okay Thank you for that. I'm going to switch over to my whiteboard and let's start talking about the mechanics of what a TDR does. Understand a TDR can be used in so many different types of industry, not just coaxial cable, but just so you can get your mind around what it can do and all things apply here. A TDR can be used on any sort of metallic cable that has at least two conductors. It doesn't have to be only two conductors, but it has to be at least a minimum of two. No single conductor wire here. So with coaxial cable, I'm referring to the center conductor versus the outer conductor or the braid. And there are many different versions of coaxial type cable. A t <clears throat> Pardon me. A TDR, of course, can be used in twisted pair. Years ago, I actually began my time in the industry in the telephone world where you have your tip versus your ring. You can use it in any of your in-home electrical wiring, your Romex cables, uh, any of your Cat5, Cat6 Plus cables. Bottom line is any metallic cable that has at least two conductors. Whenever you have two conductors that run together parallel over a distance, they will naturally form an electromagnetic field. That electromagnetic field will automatically give you a constant impedance. What a TDR is looking for is anything that interrupts that constant impedance. Now, you could say anything that interrupts the two conductors between each other 
And while that is true, it's a little bit more to it than that. But I'll give you a for instance. If you have a coaxial cable right here and it's pinched, at that point where the outer conductor is closer to the center conductor, you obviously have an impedance mismatch. Twisted pair, you could have a one side open. A TDR sees that as an impedance mismatch. We used to have this thing, actually we still have this thing in twisted pair where we have splits and resplits. Picture this. If you have a hundred pair of twisted pair cable that gets cut or damaged, at some point when they have to go back together and splice those pairs back together, somebody's going to make a mistake and accidentally get the wrong pairs crossed, right? When we go over and add digital services later on, somebody has to go back and find out where all those splits and resplits are. TDR finds that very easily. If your cable is completely cut in half, well, that's the easiest thing in the world for a TDR to find. If your cable is completely crushed, that's also the easiest thing in the world for a TDR to find. If you get water in a cable, even though the conductors may not change relationship to each other, what happens is the signal attempts to jump from one conductor to the other. So that's why a TDR, bar none, if water can be pinpointed where, excuse me, if water can be pinpointed where it is in the cable, a TDR is still going to be your best friend for finding that. Lots of things will let you know that you have water in the cable, but a TDR will still be your best friend for pinpointing it. Now, here's the deal. Typically, when we have water in the cable, we've got two separate issues, usually where the water came in and then where the water migrated to. Again, TDR is going to be your best friend for that. So, I'll mention this later on as well, and pardon me for making a mess, that is what I do. You should see me in a restaurant. Let's say if you have a twisted pair cable and you cut open the sheath and pull the conductors apart, even though the relationship of those conductors may not change to each other, again, you're going to have an impedance mismatch at that point because you're changing the relationship to the conductors. So let me ask this question as a class, and I'm going to pretend there's somebody there answering me or Mike can answer it for me. Let's say I have an entire reel or roll of cable, and I've seen this a few times. Let's say I have an entire reel or roll of cable where the center conductor is off center all the way through. The question is, does a TDR let you know you have this type of structural problem? And usually I'll open this up for discussion and lots of people have different theories and they'll say, well, the impedance changes. And sometimes people will talk about theories of VOP, which I'll get into. But the answer to the question is, if you have this problem all the way through, a TDR, <clears throat> excuse me, does not let you know you have this sort of problem. Why? Because this is still a constant impedance all the way through. Clearly, you no longer have a 75 ohm environment here, and clearly you're going to have a bunch of other types of problems, but a TDR does not let you know this is a problem. Again, with my analogies, it's not unlike a TDR looking down a railroad track and it's comparing one to the other and it says, yeah, that's perfectly straight. It's got no idea if it's supposed to be this wide or this wide. A TDR doesn't let you know you have that type of structural problem. Now, the funny thing is, is that you may wonder if you've seen something like this, couldn't you just look right at the end of that cable and see that that's off? How does something like that even escape quality control? Well, here's the deal. They did know this. They tested this cable before it left the factory, but it's not as if they're going to throw away an entire roll or reel of cable. They will, no doubt, sell it to someone knowing that it's defective at a discount. But the problem is that at some point your customer is going to end up buying it and it's going to become your problem again later on. But just so you know, TDR does not let you know you have that type of problem. Cool? All right. Yeah, that's interesting because we have seen that. Um... And I was going to be in the camp that the TDR wouldn't find it because even though the cable may not be 75 ohms, it is consistent impedance across the entire span of cable. Now, if I may add, Mike, let me tell you what does happen. So let's say you get a fire or a lightning strike in the cable or something like this happens. Will a TDR let you know you have that problem? Well, of course you do, but picture this. What if you got like a lightning strike and what if it's more subtle like this over about 20 feet? Will a TDR let you know you have that problem here? Well, I hate to sound like a salesman here, but maybe yes, maybe no. 
A lot of times it'll depend on how severe it is. And a lot of times with a TDR, it can depend on how close you are to it. So you may or you may not find it. Again, I've, I've seen a whole variety of different ways that happens. So again, just talking theory.